Evening, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We made it through. I'm just going to hold them with a short little prayer that God will watch over the words of my mouth and the thoughts that He's given me, the message that He's prepared to share. Again, I am not a profound, ordained, talented, whatever, but God, I do hear from God, and he has given me words. And I just ask that you would have ears to hear and a heart that will listen. Thank you. Amen. Many years ago, and it seems truly like a lifetime ago, I attended a conference in Toronto with Charles Price at the People's Church. And one of the main speakers was Henry Blackaby, which... He's kind of a well-known evangelist, writer, theologian, teacher. And he gave this class, that, and it stuck with me. And this was probably 14 years ago. It would have been 14 years ago. He says there's so much that the Bible doesn't say. And the Bible is our... It's our guidebook, it's our manual. It's like setting up the TV with the 15,000 buttons and things and whatever. The Bible is just like that for us on a day to day. But there's what he called phantom scriptures that have come out of the Bible. Some of them very well meaning and they sound biblical, but there's always a twist somewhere maybe a little bit taken out of context, maybe another little bit that someone's sort of interpretation that they really want someone to believe. And the Bible is supposedly one of the most revered and highly present book in many, many homes and lives, but it sadly is, one of the off, is often the one that's not read. It's there. Maybe grandma's thought of the family Bible with all the marriages and births and deaths and whatever. And it looks very stately on the table or in the closet. But it's never really open. But people will say, I have a Bible. Mm -hmm. Everyone can, anyone can quote. I'm quoting some scripture and please, I'm not, I'm only guiding through a very light surface of things, but Politicians use scripture. Motivational speakers use scripture. Um, coaches use scripture. And pastors use scripture. I have a little pop quiz I want to give you. I'm going to read off some names. And I want you to just think of it quickly. We're not going to spend much time on this. But just think of which one is not in the Bible, or which one is in the Bible. These are the words, morality, quality, rapture, trinity, frying pan, <laughs> immaculate, logic, responsibility, history, Christianity. The only one of these words that is actually in the Bible is the frying pan. And it's in Leviticus where they're talking about how to prepare the meal. And if it's made in a certain pan or, or baking pan, frying pan, that it has to be done a certain way. That's the only one of those words that is actually present in the Bible. A lot of these things, and especially in our world, where everything has a lot of marketing, big business, we get bumper stickers, they're on cards, we give out, you know, prayer cards or these little wishes of you know, stick in people's letters or cards or send them. Now, now we can send them or tweet them or whatever. Or they can be on a wall plaque or somewhere that will hang to, to uh, be to remember them. 
some of these things just off the top, moderation in all things, to thy own self be true, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, money is the root of all evil, and they go on. We have to remember that our Bible, our guidebook, was the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. Then they had to decide, they had to translate those two languages. And I have two friends actually that teach English as a second language to adults. And they say it's one of the hardest languages to learn because we have one word that has six different meanings. Think about the word love. I love my husband, I love ice cream, I love TV, I love whatever, but in other languages and in other cultures, they have different words that mean a certain kind of love, or many, many other words. So it was very difficult to get um, the right words when they were trying to translate this so that it would have the same <coughs> sense of meaning. Most of the Bible, right up until really into the 10, 1100s, it was really all uh, oral. It was very, very few people in biblical time could write. They didn't, there's no record that Jesus wrote anything. Mm -hmm. He spoke, and all these oral traditions and stories would get. And you know what happens to a story when it leaves one house and goes to another house and then another house. What happens to the gist of the story? And very few people could read. Very, very few. And so it, the first, it was translated for English, for us in English, the King James Version. And that was done in the 1600s, 1611-ish, somewhere in there. Now that's when we had thou, will, stump, does, all the great, strong, old English words that nobody felt comfortable with. They couldn't understand what was being said. And people started to struggle with this. And oftentimes, especially like in the years of the Catholic Church, right up into Vatican II, which was in the early 60s, parishioners were not permitted to have a hard copy of the Bible. Mm -hmm. It was to be interpreted by the priest, it was to be shared by the priest, and it wasn't until then that they were actually permitted to have an actual copy for themselves to read. So now it's been over 400 years since the King James Version was translated for us into English. And we do have a fair bit of ignorance and confusion, and it's ripe ground for phantom Bible scriptures just to blossom and take off. Often it becomes very well-meaning, and but with so many other things, it doesn't take very much for it to kind of veer off track. Just a little bit, maybe a word <coughs> or two. And it becomes dangerous, abusive, controlling. And sometimes it actually can be founded in heresy, like it's totally not true. The numbering of verses and the creating of chapters was done when the Bible Bible was translated. There was no, everything flowed like one right into the other, into the other, into the other, and continued on and on and on. So having numbers and chapters made it very easy to isolate a certain sentence and not pay much attention to what was said before or maybe what came after it. And that one, it was easy. Verse 7, it stood out. It was going to be kind of drawn out. There's many... Um, concepts that, just general concepts that have happened. In the garden, there's no mention of Satan. It was a serpent. We, through history and time, have just decided that it was Satan, and that's how it's portrayed, and 
sort of told. It was a fruit that Eve was tempted with. We've made it an apple. The word apple is not in the Bible. It is part of what Eve was tempted with. It was a fruit. Nothing like an apple is a fruit. So there, you know. I'm sorry, Amy, but the three wise men never visited the stable. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> no, I was reading all about various know, churches today, so go ahead. But those things, we've created this, that the three wise men came with their gifts. There were three gifts. It was one magi, probably two years for them to travel. But when we put the story together, it's a nice story. And it, picture, it pictures well. And it's not that it's wrong, it's just not the way it was, sort of thing. Jonah was swallowed by a large fish. We've decided it was a whale. But in the Bible, it was a large fish. One of the first ones, be in the world, but not off the world. It sounds sort of like it could have come out of the Sermon on the Mount. But it's a, it is sort of, it's in John, and he, Jesus is asking, praying that he take them out of the world and protect them from the evil one. And it's, a, it's sort of a paraphrase of a good thought. It's often quoted. God helps those who help themselves. There's one that's almost heresy, because that's not true. God helps us to help ourselves. Um, it was Benjamin Franklin who actually had that quote, God helps those who help themselves, which was a bit of a reflection on where the American values were and that, you know, sort of thing. This is a big one. And I've heard so many people that have, over the years, who have been hurt by this. God will not give you more than you can handle. That is not in the Bible. It's not. He will not allow you to be tempted more than you can handle, but he will, if so, he will provide an out or a, a correction for that temptation. So many people are, like, do, they get ridden with guilt. Well, if all this is happening to me and all this bad stuff, and we're talking bad stuff. We're not just talking inconvenience. Bad things to good people. And they wonder, well, what, what am I? Why has God picked on me? Why does he feel that I can handle all this? Because it, it really sets up a, a sense of, and this is where we'll kind of flow into this, it sets up to be a condemnation or shame. Not good enough. Not valued enough. Um, where two or more are gathered, and Jesus is here, again, I remember Henry pointed this out, was that Jesus is with you, even if you're in a closet by yourself. You don't need anybody else with you. And you can have as much power in your prayer and in your, your walk and your living on your own. It sure helps to have community and people. But what Jesus was really referring to was having a witness. He was talking about correction in the church or in the gatherings, and that um, if you have a witness, then then you, you have a grounds. But don't don't just be on your own. Always have two or three. Even this part was even taken out of Deuteronomy in, in chapter 17 and 19 about having having a witness with you or having someone to stand with you if you're having offense against someone. Judge not and you will not be judged or shall not be judged. We are all sinners and we all are going to be judged. And it's just that's just the way it is. I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. I can do what God wants for me with his help. I cannot go off and do anything I want and choose that and expect that God is going to if it's not his plan. Um, so there are many things that I am not going to be able to do because God has deemed that he doesn't want those things for me or you or whoever. 
cleanliness is next to godliness was John Wesley that quoted that. That's not, it sounds like a proverb, but it's not. Um, so when you read, hear these things, well, it, it sounds like it should be in the Bible, it makes sense. Spare the rod and spoil the child. It's there, but it has been so taken off the rails as far as, you know, being disciplining with love and all of that, as opposed to, you know, brutal, physical rod with the child. This too shall pass. Actually, in the King James Version of translation, it came to pass, is written 400 times in that translation. But this too shall pass has been a way we've kind of floated with it and made it a little bit better. Love the sinner, not the sin. That was Gandhi and Brother Augustine that were the quotes of that. But it's kind of, again, it has a life of its own. And it had, some, like these will have foundations in some ways. Jeremiah 29, 11. God knows the plans. He'll give you everything I want. This particular scripture, if you read before and after, was written to Israel, and they were in exile. They, they were like the war right now. They were um, in a foreign land with nothing. They were desperate. They were desolate. But God had told them they were going to be there for 70 years. But then he promised them to come home and rebuild his people. It's not always what we want from God, but what we need. A plan is always God's, no matter what it seems to be at the time. There's a professor, this is another one they told us, there's a professor of theology in the state somewhere, and when he starts off with his first new, fresh theological class, he tries to get them off guard, and he says, I want you to look up Second Hesitations, <laughs> chapter 4, <laughs> verse 3. And the verse says, there are no internal combustion engines in heaven. And then he waits to see how many are going to click, but whether what he said, because he says it in such a way like he is quoting a Bible verse. <laughs> Another one of the greatest that has brought such injustice, especially in our, I guess, are we the fourth world? No. Um, is the part about women submit to your husband and just cut it right out, cut and paste, that's it. And that has been used to control, to victimize, to abuse, to hurt, manipulate so, so many people. Um, many churches actually have this, there's a lot of this, you know, Spare the boy, spoil the child, submit to your heart. All this stuff is very foundational in almost their mission statement sort of thing. And it's greatly been misused. So whether the word of God is the word of God, whether it's Jesus' actual words, which they're documented in the New Testament, Maybe Mother Teresa has said something profound. Winston Churchill, Gandhi, whoever. The problem is not believing the, that the Bible is inspired by God. It's believing that your interpretation of it is inspired by God. These were three. I have a collection of Bibles for many, many years. I also have the family Bible with all the weddings and all the whatever in it. But you can get any kind of Bible. Like there's now there's like 400 translations in North America. Like we know the NIV, the ESV, the da da da, the LBC, whatever it is. The Message. The last one is the Passion. This is the newest sort of. Uh, in common every everyday language, you can get a Bible that you could read for the year.
here. It's all mapped out for you and guided and whatever. There's the Bible for dummies. <laughs> something for everyone. The most important thing is to read it. If you don't understand it, find someone to help you with that that you know has a deeper walk or perhaps they are more easily enlightened and understanding different things. And if it doesn't satisfy you with one person, go to two or three. Don't just stop if it's not and if it seems to be something that is condemning, shaming, abusing, hurting, manipulating, any of those things are not of God. There is no condemnation, and you can find, go to the thesaurus and find out all the words for condemnation. There's not, none in God. None. And uh, so, my message is that I read your Bible, please. Um, and it, you don't, it's not a contest, it's not a race. And some people, I remember two or three people said, well, I started reading it and I got really behind, so I just gave up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, that's not what it's about. Mm -hmm. And if you do read it, I can promise you, and I know very many well-versed scholars in this room would say, you could read it in 10 years' time, read the exact same thing, and it's going to speak entirely different to you, but it's going to speak to you truth yes. for where you are at that particular time in your life. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I, like I say, I, I pray and hope that you do refer to your Bible. Be careful. Mm -hmm. And when you hear these, you can correct people. But do it with love. And if, it, if you don't think they're going to take correction, just ignore it. Mm -hmm. on. But there's a lot, a lot of misuse of our dear Bible mm -hmm. by very many people that know better as well. Mm -hmm. So I wish you all the best of health and for this new year. <laughs>